So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the final week of our series titled Moving Forward, where we'll be talking all about, you guessed it, moving forward. And this week, I want to focus on those of us that have ever felt like we're stuck. Have you ever felt like you were stuck? I remember a few months ago, I was sitting at my kitchen table, and it wasn't a rainy day like this, but it was a little bit of a colder day. And I was just sitting at my table in my kitchen with this feeling of nothingness. This feeling of nothingness. Now, this wasn't a good feeling, and it wasn't a bad feeling. It was just almost a lack of feeling. It wasn't in a good way for me. It wasn't in a bad way. It was just something that I noticed within myself. I didn't have the sense of excitement that I had about doing things like I did before. I wasn't as excited to wake up in the morning. I wasn't as excited to go to the gym. And when I say I wasn't as excited, I mean I was sleeping in. I mean I wasn't going to the gym. I wasn't spending time with God. I wasn't motivated to do a lot of the good habits that got me to the point that I was currently in. It wasn't a good feeling. It wasn't a bad feeling. I was just feeling stuck. And as I was sitting at my kitchen table thinking about this, why am I feeling stuck? I thought about it more and more and more, and I quickly realized why I was feeling stuck in my life. And this is one of those moments that I will never forget because it's what Pastor Mike calls a mind shift. It was one of those moments when my thinking flipped. The reason I was feeling stuck in my life, I realized that at the ripe old age of 23, I had accomplished all of my life goals. Now you might be saying, come on, you're exaggerating. I am dead serious when I tell you that at the age of 23, I had accomplished all of my life goals. I started working at the age of 18, and for those five years, I told myself three things. I want to get my own place, I want to enjoy my car, and I want to enjoy my life. And I had done those three things at the age of 23, and I am not exaggerating at all. I had legitimately accomplished all of my goals. And I remember there, sitting at the table, and I promise I'm not dramatic, it's just the way that my mind works. And I was thinking to myself, you know, if I died today, I wouldn't be disappointed with my life. I look back on my life and say, it was a nice journey. There's not like there was anything way out in the future that I was really looking forward to. So I'd say, I'd be fine if that happened. And if you're here sitting in your seat and you're saying, Pastor Josh, I'd be fine if you died too. <laughs> you can meet me at the altar after church and we'll handle business, all right? <laughs> but I realized very quickly that I was stuck. And I went into work and I spoke to Pastor Mike about how I was feeling, this feeling of being stuck. And what he helped me to realize was that I was stuck because of where my focus was. I was stuck because of where my focus was. My focus was on three small goals that I had already accomplished, and my focus was still on these three small goals, even though I had already done them. It's like I was looking over here to the left while life kept on moving to the right. My focus stayed the same even though life kept on moving forward. And I want to ask you again, have you ever felt stuck? Maybe you're like me, and you are stuck because you're focused on a few small goals in your life. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in a relationship. Maybe you feel like you're stuck at work, like you're stuck at home. And maybe you're what I like to call double dutch stuck. You know what double dutch stuck is? It's when you're stuck getting stuck. And if you're here wondering what it has to do with jump rope, absolutely nothing. But I was practicing my sermon, and I said it in my office, and I laughed by myself like a nerd because I said it, so I decided to leave it in my notes. But to, yes, I, just so you know something about me, 
If you ever saw the way that I talk to myself and laugh by myself, you'd think I was a crazy man. But it's something I do quite often. But today I want to look into the scriptures and look at this story in the Bible of a man who was stuck, who was fixated on the wrong things. He was a man with a few problems just like you and I. Let's read John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, that Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda. Say that with me. Say Bethesda. Bethesda. Say it one more time. Bethesda. Bethesda. Now keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. And it says that at this place named Bethesda, there was five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, they lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there, so he was lame, his legs did not walk, had been sick for 38 years. In verse 6 it says, when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, watch what Jesus says, he says, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? Well, the man responds, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Now, a bit of context was all these people who were sick were sitting around this area because there was water that would begin to stir. And when the water would begin to stir, if you could get in there fast enough before the others around you, whatever issues you had in your body, you would be healed from. So this man is saying, I can't get healed because I have no way to get into the water. He's saying he's too slow to get to the water. So this man who's been sick for 38 years is speaking with Jesus. And when he's asked why, or he's asked, would you like to get well? He responds, I can't get well because I am stuck. I can't get well because I'm stuck. I have nobody to put me into the water. And maybe you felt this way before. Like you're stuck because there's nobody to help you move forward in your life. Now I want us to notice for a second what Jesus did not ask the man. Jesus did not say, do you need somebody to put you in the water? Jesus did not say, would you like me to put you into the water? Jesus did not say, are you able to crawl into the water in your own strength? He asked him, would you like to be made well? And the man responds as if Jesus asked, why aren't you healed? And this man is stuck on this idea of getting into the water. If I could just get into the water, then my life would be different. If I could just get into the water, then I would be whole. If I could just get into the water, my legs would finally work. And I think we've all been guilty of this before. When God is speaking to us and we're not getting what he's saying because we're stuck with the wrong focus in our minds. It's so easy for us to get so stuck and focused on the way that we want something to happen that we forget about the one who can make it happen for us. We can get so focused on creating an answer that we forget that the one who is the answer is standing right in front of us. Here's an example of that. You have a bad knee. And God asks you, do you want to be made whole? And you respond, I don't have health insurance for the surgery. God asks you, do you want to encounter my peace? And you say, if the kids would just be quiet for 30 minutes, then I would encounter peace. God asks you, do you want to get out of this bad financial situation? And you say, I just can't get the raise at the job. Do you want to stop crying yourself to sleep at night? All the negative thoughts pile in when nobody's talking to me. And God is speaking to us, but we're not receiving what he's saying because we're stuck on the wrong thing. Just like I said in my story at the beginning, that I was stuck because my focus was in the wrong direction. The man in the story 
was stuck on getting into the water. And the funny thing is that Jesus in the Bible is known as the living water. The water was standing right in front of him, but he was stuck. Today, if our ears and our hearts are open, I believe that God is asking all of us a question. I really believe that for every person in this room that God is asking you a question. And a funny thing about God is that when he asks us questions, he's not asking us because he doesn't know what the answer is. God asks us questions because we need an answer. God asks us questions because we are looking for something. And we can miss out on what he's doing if we only focus on the obstacle standing in our way instead of trusting in the way maker. Now, let's look at this just from all the way step back. Now, there's only one person in all of human history with the title of the healer. And that man was Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus was not walking around the earth in flesh for all of human history. If we exaggerate a little bit and say it's just a 50-year gap where Jesus was on the earth. For all of humanity, not many people could have talked to the healer. And this man is talking to the healer, telling him why he can't be healed. He's so fixated on the healing that he failed to acknowledge the healer. And this sounds crazy, right? What kind of crazy person would ever do that? Me. I remember one time when I was in college, I really wanted to go to this conference. There was a group on campus that was going to a conference. I wanted to go with them, but it wasn't like I can just reach into my piggy bank to pay for this conference. So I said, all right, I need money for the conference, so I'm going to get a job, right? So I go into my dorm. I got on my nice church shoes, my nice church pants, a nice dress shirt, put on a tie all nice, do the hallelujah smile. And I go down to a local mall and I walk in. Sir, how many to eat today? Praise the Lord, sister. Looking for a job. You know, God is just so good. Amen, amen, amen. Talking all crazy. I wasn't actually talking that way. But I was being extra friendly. I was trying to put on my best performance to try to get a job. So I get five job applications. I fill them out back in my dorm. I put the dress clothes back on the next day, and I drop them off. A nice red, white, and blue handshake to the person you drop it off to. And I'm like, all right, I should be good. I'm going to get one of these five jobs. Come on, it's five. I smiled. I had on a tie. How could you not hire me? Guess what I didn't get? Not just not a job. I didn't get an interview. Nobody even called me back. I get picked up from college three weeks before the conference, and I say, well, I guess I'm not going to this conference. Wouldn't you know that the person picking me up gave me the exact amount of money that I needed to go to this conference? And it gets better. The person that gave me the money to go to the conference did not have the money to give to me until somebody else gave them the money to give to me to go to this conference. And in that moment, it's like, oh, yeah, God, maybe he could help me when I needed money to go to this conference. I was so focused on the money that I forgot about God. So focused on the provision that I didn't even talk to the provider. This man in the story was so focused on the healing that he didn't recognize the healer. And maybe you feel like you've done this before. Whatever thing that you're dealing with or but you're looking to make progress in. Now we're talking about healing, so let's just stay in that way. Maybe you're so focused on getting healthy that you forgot about the healer. Now, follow me here. I'm not saying to eat the donuts and the fried chicken and double fried goat milk, whatever you want to eat, and then pray to God like, God, why is my blood pressure going up? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is in those moments where you're feeling stuck, 
where you're doing all that you can, where you're striving with all your strength and you feel like you're not moving forward, I want to encourage you in those moments that when you bring God into your situation, when you talk to God about it, when you acknowledge God in that moment with you, that God will not only meet your expectations, but he will exceed even what you can ask or imagine. Because in this story, watch this, this man was stuck looking at the water. He was stuck being lame for 38 years. He was stuck watching people get what he wanted all the time but never could get to. But what he failed to realize, and I love this, was that God's goodness was stuck to him. God's goodness was stuck to him. I'm so glad in those moments where we feel stuck that God's goodness and God is there with us. I'm so glad in those moments when we want to quit, when we want to just give up, that God is there with us. I'm so glad in my story that I didn't even ask for something and God still blessed me with it. I'm so glad that his goodness is stuck to me. And watch what happens in verse 8. In verse 8, it says, after this man's done telling Jesus why he can't get healed, Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. See, all this means is that when Jesus steps into your situation, the situation changes. When Jesus steps in, things that were stuck start to move forward. When Jesus steps in, things that were dead for four days raise up to life. When Jesus steps in, the things that you thought were gone forever come back to life. When Jesus steps in, the legs that didn't work begin to work because there is power in the name of Jesus. At the name and at the word of Jesus, this lame man gets up immediately and he begins to walk. His legs start up after 38 years. Let that sink in. 38 years. His legs didn't work. And things start right up. I don't know if you've ever seen a video of someone that's gotten into a car accident and they have to go to rehab because they haven't walked in two months. And they almost have to learn how to walk again. 38 years and this man jumps to his feet. His legs start up right away. And I think anybody with a car, with a battery that's not starting too fast, knows the fear of something not working the way it's designed to work. All of us who have ever been in a cold New York winter with a car battery that's not quite starting, and we know that we should change the battery, and we just say, I'll change it next week. I'll change it next week. I'll change it next week. And then you walk outside after 38 hours of not starting your car, and the cold hits you, and you, oh. And you got your key, and you're walking to your car like, way maker, miracle worker, <laughs> car starter. And you sit down in your car because you barely have time to make it to work. And you put the key in the ignition, you just, hey, God, right now, this car needs to start. And you turn it to the opposition and you, oh, God, let this car start. And you turn it and the car just, ah, 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 ah. And you just, a te bo show in the name of Jesus. And the car starts and you're like, yes. The car started after not starting for 38 hours. And this man, after 38 years, immediately jumps up to his feet how much greater of a miracle is that? And what I love about this story is that this man who has been lame for 38 years and laying down on this bed, that when he jumps up, he's now carrying the thing that was carrying him. He's carrying the bed that had been carrying him. I wonder what things in this season of your life that are your floor right now that you're going to carry into the next season as a testament of God's faithfulness. I wonder what areas that you're going to conquer with the help and with the word of God. And you're going to carry it as a reminder of what God has done in your life. 
You see, when we receive the words that God is speaking to us by faith, and we hear what he's saying to us by faith, we can move from being stuck to moving forward. When we understand by faith that by his stripes we are healed, things begin to change. When we understand by faith that we are above and never beneath, things begin to change. When we understand that God is for us and not against us, things begin to change. When we understand that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, things begin to change. And I want to let you in on the top secret. This will revolutionize your life forever. Want to know the main thing that needs to change in your life? You. You know the main thing that needs to change in my life? Me. I am my biggest obstacle in this life. Because the changes that we see on the outside usually don't start and end on the outside. They usually start on the inside. Because the change I want to see, it begins with me. I can pray all day long, God change this, God change this, God change this. But if I had a revelation of the authority that God has placed on the inside of me and the spirit of God that I carry on the inside of me, I would walk into those situations, speak the name of Jesus, and they would change at his name. I believe that as believers and as Christians that God has given us the authority to walk into situations, see things that were stuck, and see them move forward at the name of Jesus. You see, we're not seeing changes because God did something extra. We see these changes because we have a greater understanding and revelation of the work that was finished, of what God has already done. So where do we start today? Where do we start I believe that if you want to go from being stuck to moving forward, that it starts with a question. It starts with a question. My question was, why am I feeling a sense of nothingness in my life? The lame man in the story was asked the question, do you want to be made well? And today I wonder, what is God asking you what is God asking you I want to ask you where are you feeling stuck in your life and I want to remind you that in our story we saw that the lame man wasn't quite getting it he was telling Jesus the reasons why he couldn't get healed if God is asking you today do you want to be made well simply say yes if God is asking you, do you want a restored marriage or relationship, just say yes. If God is asking you if you want to encounter his peace, just say yes. If he's asking you, do you want to encounter my presence, just say yes. And remember, whatever God is asking you today, he's not looking for the answer. He is the answer. He is the one that can make the difference. And as I was writing this and I began to think about why would somebody want to stay stuck? Why would I want to stay stuck in a situation that might not be good for me or not might, be, might not be benefiting me? And I think one reason why we stay stuck, whether it's in a bad work situation, bad home, in a bad relationship, one reason we stay stuck is we don't think we deserve any better. We stay stuck because we think that we've earned what we're living. Even if we're not happy where we're at, we say, you know what? I deserve this because I'm not worth any better. It's like, why would I ask God to make me whole when I was the one that hurt my body? Why would I ask God to mend my broken heart when I was the one that put myself into that relationship why would I ask God to encounter his presence when I'm the one that turned my back on him all those years ago? I mean, I've hurt other people, so I deserve to feel hurt, right? If you're here today and you think you're not worth anything more than your current situation, even if it's bad for you because of your past, 
I wanted to let you know something that God snuck into this story. This man was laying down in a place named ba Bethesda. You know what Bethesda means? It means the house of mercy. Bethesda means the house of mercy. All of us here today in this room have made mistakes. All of us in this room, in our own strength, are not good enough to go before a holy God. All of us here today in this room don't deserve, we haven't earned God's goodness. But everybody in this room gets to live in this place known as Bethesda. We all get to live in the house of mercy. Not because we deserve better, because we've earned better, but because of what Jesus did for us. What mercy is in the Bible is not getting a punishment that you deserve. It's not getting something bad that you deserve. And when God the Father poured out judgment and condemnation on his son Jesus, you know what he poured on us? Bethesda. He poured his mercy out on us when he put the punishment on his son. And Jesus took the punishment. He took the penalty so that we could live in this place known as Bethesda. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible has this message sown all throughout it. There's other scriptures like, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And not only did God have mercy on us, as if that wasn't more than enough, he also gave us his grace. The grace of God is simply unearned or unmerited favor. Goodness that we could never earn, but God has freely given it to us today. And if you're the person here that feels like you don't deserve any better, I want to encourage you to abide and to rest in this place known as Bethesda. I want to encourage you, like Pastor Mike said in our series on forgiveness, to forgive yourself. It's very easy to forgive other people sometimes compared to ourselves. It's very easy to look down on ourselves day after day after day. I want to encourage you to forgive yourself because Christ has forgiven you. If you're feeling stuck, what is God asking you today? And if you don't know what God's asking you today, I want to encourage you to talk to God the same way you would talk to a friend and ask him and listen for his voice. Look into his word. Do a search of maybe a situation you feel stuck in and see what pops up in the Bible. I want to encourage you today, if your mind is focused and fixated on the wrong direction, to take a step of faith and take a step in the right direction. Maybe you need to dream again. Maybe you need to dream bigger. Like something about me is like when it comes to dream, like dreams, I'm horrible at coming up with dreams. I have to really sit down and say, all right, what do I want to grow in? You know my dream right now? It's not really a dream, but I, I used it for now. My dream is to get better. That's the dream that I'm working on right now, to just to keep on improving, to keep moving forward. But I also want to encourage you to acknowledge the one standing in front of you. Because Jesus is as close as the mention of his name. Jesus is here with us right now in this very moment. And if you remember before, when Jesus walked in, things begin to change. If you came in here carrying a burden that you don't want to carry anymore, that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, Jesus says, come to me, those who are heavy, those who are burdened, and cast it onto him. Give your cares and your struggles on to him. 
Because when we give over those weights to Jesus and those things that have been holding us back, we can go from being stuck to moving forward. Now, one question that every believer has to answer at one point or another is whether or not we want to trust in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And what that is, is we're simply acknowledging that we believe in God, that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. And not only did he die for us, but he rose again for us. And here at Family Church, we all pray a prayer together that goes like this. Repeat after me. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and to make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, real quick, is there anybody in the room that prayed that prayer for the very first time? Could you wave at me so that we can celebrate you real quick? Anybody at all? We have one. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time online today, you can also type in amen, and one of our online hosts will reach out to you. Before we leave, actually, Pastor Mike. Okay. I'll just see if he was going to let me come back up and speak for two seconds. Uh, I love that message that he preached today. I, I realized that the, the man at the pool of Bethesda was stuck on his auto-reply. He was stuck with an auto-reply. You know what that is? I can't. It didn't matter what the question was. The answer was already going to be I can't. In our own lives, we do that a lot. In my house, I can't is a cuss word. That's a bad word. You can't say that in my house. I can't. Because the question is, did you ever try? I think to myself, the layman, I mean, could, did he ever try to like at least rock his head enough to get a little momentum to roll in? See, you can get stuck in both failure and success. Do you know how you get stuck in success? You get stuck in success when you stop playing the game of life to win and you start playing to simply not lose. As a young person, Josh was playing life to win. At 18, getting a job, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna save my money, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win. But now that I got all my stuff, I gotta make sure I don't lose it. And you get stuck in success when your eyes change, the focus changes. Some of us who have great success in our lives need to dream again. What does retirement look like? What does retirement look like? What does the next season of life, what does grandparenthood look like? Do you want to be a better grandparent than your grandparents were? I'm just saying, guys, we've got to have this vision of always moving forward. And if you don't have somebody in your life that is constantly kind of like, hey, man, let's go. Let's, let's think differently. Let's, then, then get into a group of people. Find some new friends. Get into a room of people that you're not the smartest one. Get into a group of people that you're not the richest one. Get surrounded by other people who think differently, who are going to challenge you to move forward. Listen, we've got one shot at this life. We've got one shot at this life. We've got 120 years max to do this thing and to have fun doing it and to live it in a way that honors God. One shot. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The pool is right there. The blessing is there. The provision is there. We got to get eyes on the provider. Lord, what would you have me do? Let me think differently. Think about this for a second. God said in Jeremiah, uh, is it 129? The most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's really, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. So let's just say this for a minute. If God has a plan and a design and a blueprint, I promise you it's a whole lot better than the current life you're living. Yeah. 
I want to get a, I just want to sneak peek. I want to sneak peek at that blueprint of that plan, of that thought. Let me think differently, God. Let me see differently. Let me get unstuck and move my life forward. Next month, we're starting a brand new series for the Mother's Day month called Hashtag Struggling. It's not going to be a negative series, I promise you. Hashtag struggling. We're going to talk about some things that are struggles in life, but we're also going to create a lot of opportunity to fix those things that could be struggles in life. All right? Mother's Day, you do not want to miss out. We're going to be doing a bunch of giveaways for Mother's Day, and then we have a big announcement on Mother's Day about Father's Day. So we don't, we're not forgetting the dads. I'm telling you right now, Father's Day is going to be epic. Epic. If you're a dad watching online and you haven't been in church in a long time, you're going to want to get here. Trust me. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God today. We thank you for lives transformed. We thank you for a mind shift that we can begin to think differently. Think the way you think, God. Lord, you said that you would provide all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Help us to believe that. Help us to get our eyes on the provider and not simply on the provisions. Help us to desire a relationship with you more and more each day. And thank you, Lord, as we leave here today, that we are protected, we are safe. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you. Offering baskets are at the doors on the way out.